Hi there, my friend. This is Łukasz from Enterfea, and today we will discuss linear versus nonlinear buckling. I think this is one of the very popular questions. This is why I decided to make a short video for you about it. So, at first, let's talk about what linear and nonlinear buckling really are. Linear buckling is an analysis that allows you to quickly estimate the buckling capacity of the model. It computes really fast, is easy to define correctly, and basically there are no convergence problems in the solution, which means that it doesn't require a lot of experience. You get a load multiplier, which basically informs you uh, by which number you have to multiply the loads you have implemented into the model, in order to reach a load that causes a stability failure of ideal model. Unfortunately, uh, there are some drawbacks to this analysis. First of all, as the name suggests, it's linear, which means that it cannot take nonlinearities into account. And also, in some cases, the outcome can be simply wrong. And by wrong, I mean not accurate, because of course the outcome is there. It's simply not as precise as I would wish it to be. On another hand, nonlinear buckling is a very robust tool. It allows you to take into account whatever nonlinearities that come in your mind. It also gives you a stability path, the chart of deformation against applied load of the model, which have enormous amount of information in it in, by itself. It's an awesome tool as well. The outcomes are far more robust. Also because you get an actual deformation of the model, before but also after failure, and you can animate instability failure process. I know that animations aren't really engineering tool, but you will be surprised how often I actually send animations of failure process to my customers, simply to show them what is going on, so I don't have to describe it very precisely in the reports. And usually people are very happy with this solution, so it is a bonus, even not in case of actual analysis of the problem, rather presenting outcomes. But this is also very important. Unfortunately, nonlinear buckling has also some drawbacks. Most of those go away with your experience. Well, this is a difficult analysis to set up. At least it's far more difficult than linear buckling, where you should simply press calculate and it's done. There are parameters to be set, different solvers to be used, and so on and so on. There are also convergence problems. So from time to time, you need to calculate something several times, check different solver settings, and basically it's a bit more frustrating, especially at the beginning. So there is a learning curve there. But after a while, when you get enough experience with it, it's not as hard as it may sound. Unfortunately, there is one thing that will never go away, and that is that computing of nonlinear buckling takes much more time than computing on linear buckling. At some point, you will of course learn about memory allocation and different solver settings and tactics to speed things up. Perhaps you will even buy a better computer to run analysis quicker. But in the end, whatever you will do, nonlinear buckling will always take much time. At least much more when you compare it to linear buckling. And from time to time, this can be a serious drawback. So now let's take a look at a simple example to compare the outcomes from both analyses. Firstly, you can see that I've chosen a simply compressed shell supported on four sectional supports, for instance, columns. All the dimensions and required informations are given here. Note that we are using elastic steel. If I would assume that yielding has any impact on stability failure in this case, this wouldn't be a quote-unquote fair competition, because linear buckling cannot take yielding into account at all which means that it's not suitable to solve such a problem. Here, however, I am using elastic steel, assuming that even if yielding has influence on the outcome, I am not taking it into account both in linear and nonlinear analysis. 
In linear buckling, you can see here that the first eigenvalue is 0.73. This means that if I multiply the applied load of 50 kN per meter with this value, I will get a critical load, which is 36.55 kN per meter of circumference. This is the, the load by which the ideal shell loses stability due to buckling. With nonlinear buckling, the outcome is a nice stability plot. You can see on the horizontal axis the vertical displacement of the top ring, and on vertical the load multiplier corresponding to this deformation. It is easy to spot that the maximum value is 0,612, and after this value the model collapses, which can be seen as decrease in both deformation and also load multiplier. What is important, I can actually see how the model behaves after failure, and I can trace the post-critical outcomes as well. For now, the important fact is that I've managed to establish the critical multiplier. Again, I am using the reference value of 50 kN per meter, the load I have applied in my model, and I get the critical load, which is in this case 30.6 kN per meter of circumference. Now, let's compare both analyses. You can see that linear buckling on the left produced a critical force of 36.55 kN per meter, while on the right, nonlinear buckling produced a critical force of 30.6 kN per meter. This is around 16% difference, and it is commonly believed that in all cases, linear buckling overestimates the capacity of the model by around 15%. In most cases, or at least in many cases, this is true, but there are some in which this rule does not work, and the linear buckling can actually overpredict the capacity by a higher margin. So, whatever you are doing and whatever you are analyzing, be sure to take into account that linear buckling can actually overpredict the capacity of the model. Also, look at the formations. Linear buckling, especially in discretely supported shells, tend to give the modes of deformation which has very high differences of deformations in both to the inside and to the outside on a relatively small area of the model, while nonlinear buckling tend to produce bigger shapes which are usually more uniform in geometry. And I would say those obtained from nonlinear buckling are far more realistic. Also, take into account that often people are using linear buckling shape as imperfection for nonlinear buckling analysis. Such approach may not always be correct. Think about it this way. If the structure of the shell we are analyzing here would in reality, in non-linear world, want to buckle, as you can see on the right. Implementing imperfections as seen on the left would really not be the critical part. There are different, more severe imperfections you should also consider. So, remember about this as well. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions or remarks, there is a comment section below this video. Please leave them there, I will do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. This video covers few of the topics I discuss in a free finite element analysis course I have made for my subscribers. If you are interested in finite element analysis, follow the link you can find below this video and enroll for the course. It's free and I'm pretty certain you'll find it worth your while. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day and see you next time. Bye.